Tell me what was in that big white box on the pallet truck. No one can prepare you for something so terrible, to lose a loved one in such a way. I think Jane would, be, would still have been here if it wasn't for the internet. Welcome to Crime Lapse. I am Eileen. And I am Charlie. On April 19, 2003, emergency services responded to a call about a fire at Sussex Bird Sanctuary. At 8.20pm, a motorist who spotted the flames phoned the fire brigade, who responded and extinguished the blaze. It was only when the fire was out that they realised what was burning. It was a woman's body. The body was burnt beyond recognition, but it was well preserved. Police immediately suspected the deceased to be a local woman who had gone missing five weeks earlier. But where had Jane Longhurst been all that time? This is Behind the Yellow Door. On the morning of March 14th, 2003, 31-year-old Jane Longhurst left her home in Brighton, England. She had her purse and her phone. Her partner Malcolm, an educational welfare officer, went to work at 6.45am. He kissed his partner goodbye and left. Malcolm said, quote, She always had Fridays off and never wasted the day by lounging around. She would get up early, plan her schoolwork, tidy the flat, play her viola or go to the gym. Unquote. Jane got up and shopped for some groceries. She came home and listened to music and worked on her computer for a time. She then rang a friend from the orchestra she and Malcolm played with. The friend recalled Jane seeming, quote, absolutely normal and cheerful, very upbeat, unquote. They said they would see each other at rehearsals that Sunday before ending the call. At 10am, she sent a text to a work colleague asking about getting paint for the flat she shared with Malcolm. She rang her friend Lisa's home to see how she was feeling after some bad morning sickness, but Lisa was at work, so Jane had spoken with Lisa's partner. At some stage that afternoon, Jane's phone was switched off and she never used it again. When Malcolm returned home that evening, Jane wasn't there. This was strange and he wasn't able to get in contact with her, so he called Jane's mother Liz. Malcolm asked Liz if she knew where Jane was. She'd had plans with her mother to go to an exhibition in London, but her mum hadn't been feeling well so they postponed the trip. Liz hadn't heard from Jane, but presumed that she was probably at the local youth centre. Malcolm was briefly relieved and agreed to go and look there for her. Jane often volunteered at the youth club. She was a gifted classical musician. She was a dedicated educator who would always take on extra roles to share her love of music, such as working with the Brighton Youth Orchestra. Jane wasn't at the youth club, and because her mobile was off, Malcolm became increasingly worried. Jane was not the type to not tell anyone where she was going. After calling Jane's friends and finding that no one else had seen or heard from Jane that day, Malcolm's fear was compounded by the realisation that Jane was missing. When she hadn't come home by midnight, Malcolm phoned the police. Initially, Jane's disappearance was treated as an ordinary missing persons inquiry. Because no one had heard from her, including her boyfriend, they assumed that the couple had argued and Jane left to gather her thoughts. As the days passed, the inquiry heightened. Door-to-door inquiries were carried out and all of Jane's loved ones and neighbours were questioned. Following initial interviews, the case was passed to the CID. The police knew Jane was a stable, kind-hearted, financially steady woman in a happy relationship with a full-time job, so for her to be missing now for 48 hours with no trace, friends and investigators on the case feared the worst. Both her mobile phone and bank card had been unused since Friday morning. Jane was a music and English teacher at Upland School in Brighton. She'd worked there for three years. She was supposed to be teaching classes and had a church concert scheduled for the weekend. It was planned that Jane would be playing the viola. Jane's mother Liz said that it wasn't like her daughter to not contact anyone. Quote, I am extremely worried. I just cannot think what could have happened. I just want her to call us and let us know she is safe, unquote. Malcolm, Liz and Jane's older sister Sue had been calling Jane's phone persistently since she vanished on the 14th. 
forensic experts had searched the couple's flat and found nothing. Police were scouring CCTV and phone records to try and trace Jane's movements. The public were asked to help in the inquiry to find the missing woman, who was described as being white, with short brown hair, 5 foot 5 inches in height and 10 stone. Jane's family made an appeal for anyone with information to come forward. Her sister Sue said, quote, Where are you? We miss you. The hardest part is simply not knowing what has happened, which is where we need the help of both the public and the media. As time goes by, we're finding it increasingly hard to cope. Unquote. Malcolm feared his girlfriend had been abducted. Jane wouldn't travel anywhere without telling someone. He said, quote, It's a real mystery. She is a very dependable, reliable person, just a normal, run-of-the-mill professional, happy, working woman. We hadn't had an argument. We don't really row. Like any other couple, we disagree, but nothing big. It's very distressing and extremely strange. Unquote. Four days after Jane was reported missing, the police launched Operation Keen. 45 officers were brought in to expand the search. House-to-house inquiries were carried out, and gardens were combed for evidence. Hours and hours of CCTV was being viewed, a huge resource stretch for the investigative team. A huge media appeal was launched. Jane's mother, partner, sister and friends would appear, pleading with Jane to come home or for anyone with any evidence to come forward. Following these appeals, the public reported sightings of Jane in Southampton, Wales and all over Brighton. Two weeks passed and no real evidence or leads had been reported. Police began to question whether this was a missing persons case or a murder or abduction case. By day 12 of the search, the police were fearing the worst. Jane hadn't been seen on CCTV travelling anywhere out of Brighton and her phone had been off since the day she vanished. DCI Steve Dennis was heading up Operation Keen, the investigation that had been launched after Jane's disappearance. DCI Dennis said the case simply didn't make sense. Quote, We are keeping an open mind, however, as time goes on, we are naturally becoming increasingly concerned for Jane's safety. Unquote. I also want to appeal to anyone else who might know of my daughter's whereabouts or knows who knows anything about her disappearance. Brighton and Hove, lovingly dubbed London by the Sea due to its cosmopolitan nature, is the only town in Britain to have a Grade 1 listed peer and it's loved by many, whether young or old. Brighton is thought of as a happy place to visit, a seaside town for holidaying, and to locals, it's a vibrant yet chilled, safe and friendly community. That is why when Jane Longhurst vanished without a trace from her home on Friday 14th of March 2003, it shook the entire city. Jane had lived in a ground floor flat on Shaftesbury Road, Brighton. She and her partner Malcolm had discussed relocating to Bath together. The couple had been together for four years. There was nothing to suggest that they were anything other than content with each other. They were financially stable, had good friends, and Jane was an accomplished musician. They both enjoyed their work. Friends Jane spoke to that morning said she seemed happy and nothing was out of the ordinary. No one could understand how she went missing. Jane had every Friday off work, and the Friday she vanished started off like any other. When she hadn't come home by Monday for work, the investigators began to worry. Jane hadn't taken any clothes or belongings with her. Jane's mother Liz said, quote, We are in limbo, and it is horrible, horrible. All we can do is take each day as it comes. I try to block out thoughts of what might have happened. We've got to be positive for Jane's sake because we simply do not know what has happened. The thought of one of my children disappearing has always given me the horrors, but I thought it was something that happens to other people. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, Unquote. Liz spoke about the last time she talked to her daughter, two days before she went missing, saying, quote, We are very close. We are good friends. Jane is very tactful. She would sometimes say to me, You can't say that, Mum. And she was always right. It was a Wednesday. Jane was on her way to work. She often called me on her mobile as she went to school. I can't remember the details of the conversation. It probably ended with her saying, I've got to run. She was always so busy. I would have said, have a good day or something fairly trite, unquote. Liz said that she was glad Jane's father wasn't alive to experience the pain she felt. The concert that Jane was supposed to have been playing in had an empty chair. Mother's Day came and went. 
Jane would never miss a chance to wish her mum well. DCI Dennis said, quote, This is totally out of character, and if Jane could have got to a phone to speak to her mum on the special day, then she would, no matter where she is. The fact that Jane did not call her mum on Mother's Day, coupled with all the other lines of inquiry we have followed up in the past two weeks, suggests Jane has not gone anywhere out of choice. We believe that she has been abducted and probably killed. As such, this is now a major crime inquiry. Unquote. Once Jane had been reported missing, the police immediately interviewed Malcolm. They also made local inquiries with neighbours, friends, family and those who knew Jane. Everyone mirrored the fact that this was extremely out of character for Jane. Ellie Blackshaw, a friend of Jane, said her leaving and not even telling Malcolm where she had gone, quote, rang alarm bells, unquote. After almost three weeks, the detectives believed that Jane had probably been a victim of foul play. They searched the walls of the couple's flat and over 40 extra officers were brought in to assist. All of the CCTV from bus and train stations were examined and extensive door-to-door and open searches were conducted. When the police began to suspect Jane was dead, officers were relocated to woodland areas around Brighton. For two weeks, the searches were unfruitful. Police were struggling to find a suspect. As with every missing persons inquiry, the people closest to Jane fell under suspicion almost immediately. This included her partner Malcolm and her music teacher. Both were ruled out and the police were back to square one. Phone records revealed that the last call Jane had made was at 10.05am to her friend Lisa Stevens' house. Lisa hadn't been home and her partner Graham Coote said that he had just had a quick chat with Jane about Lisa's pregnancy. Over 100 officers were working on the case, but it was still puzzling the Sussex police. Nine detectives were following up intelligence reports, but nothing turned up any evidence. The weeks passed without any information about Jane's whereabouts. By April 10th, the family appealed again for help to find Jane. Liz said, quote, We are increasingly worried. We are expecting the worst and want to know what has happened, no matter how hard it is to accept. We want the nightmare to come to an end. Unquote. A £5,000 reward was offered by Sussex Police. Second in command of Operation Keen, Detective Inspector Chris Standard said, quote, The investigation team is becoming increasingly frustrated by the lack of information. Since Jane went missing four weeks ago, officers have worked tirelessly and around the clock to try and find her. The investigation has certainly confirmed that Jane had no intention of leaving of her own choice. We think something serious has happened to Jane and that she has been killed. Unquote. The thought of Jane's death was a massive blow to her family but they just wanted to know either way. They always knew Jane wouldn't run away. Jane was born in Reading. She grew up in Stanhope Road with her parents, Bill and Liz, and older sister, Sue. As a child, she attended George Palmer Infant School before going on to Maiden Early Comprehensive School. Her mother, Liz Longhurst, describes Jane as a, quote, very lovely, happy child, unquote. She portrays adult Jane as a beautiful soul, Someone so kind it was easy to love her, easy to like her, and easy to get along with her, no matter who you were. She had learned to play the violin at five years old and had a passion for music. Jane's love for music spurred her on to attend Liverpool University to obtain a degree before going to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. During her postgraduate studies at Sussex University, Jane met Malcolm Sentence. She moved to Brighton in the mid-90s and got a spot on the local orchestra playing the violin. She started teaching English and music at a school for children with learning and behavioural difficulties. The head teacher, Paul Atkins, said, quote, Jane is highly respected, very well liked and extremely conscientious. She is the type of teacher who doesn't take time off sick, who runs after school clubs and is always full of bright new ideas. She is dedicated to the school, unquote. Jane was devoted to her students and her music. Cynthia Errolt, the friend Jane spoke to about the orchestra rehearsals on the morning of her disappearance, said, Jane is very happy and a popular member, very lively and attractive. Jane never missed a concert or a rehearsal. She is a very positive, confident and dedicated person and musician. No one can see her walking away from her life. We are all in a state of shock. We don't bear to think what may have happened to her, but she is not a wimp. She is a strong, positive character she would fight back. We all feel terribly sad for her, her family and Malcolm. All of us are feeling for her. Unquote. 
Malcolm was desperate to find her. He had been suspected as being involved in Jane's disappearance and was unable to sleep with worry. His computer was seized and he had to give DNA samples, but still he put on a brave face and canvassed the area, putting up posters and searching her favourite spots. He said, The police need a lead and they have chosen to start at the flat. This is all right because they have to do their job, but it is very stressful. I think they are looking for spots of blood, signs of a struggle or DNA from known criminals. When I came home, the computer was on and the stereo too, I think. The window was open. We were thinking of moving to Hove or possibly Bath or Bristol, so she might have been researching houses on the internet. I had no inkling anything was wrong until about 6pm when I hadn't heard from her. Unquote. On Saturday the 19th of April, with Jane missing almost five weeks, a local man reported a fire just south of the A283 and RSBP Nature Reserve at Wigan Holt Common near Pulborough. There, about 20 miles away from Brighton, Daniel Fowler, who had discovered the fire, noticed the flames seemed a funny colour, so he called 999 to report the fire. Once the fire brigade arrived and Daniel began to drive away from the scene, he was flagged down by an officer and told to return, as this wasn't just a fire, it was a body burning. Police were called here to Wigan Bolt Common on Saturday evening after reports of a fire but when they arrived and the flames were extinguished, they discovered the remains of a young woman. A post-mortem revealed it to be Jane Longhurst. She'd been strangled and had been dead for some time. Her killer had disposed of her body at this nature reserve and had set it alight. 35 days after Jane went missing, the naked, burnt body of an adult female was found near a nature reserve 20 miles from Brighton. Forensic teams and the investigators for Jane's case were quickly on the scene. The body was laid upon blue tarpaulin and cardboard and printed with the Cleanies logo. A box marked fragile was on the woman's head. Her face had been covered with a green scarf. The body had been doused in petrol and set alight in an area that was not secluded or well hidden. DCI Steve Dennis said, quote, It is bizarre. It must have been an urgent gut reaction that whoever it was had to get rid of her body. It was a panic type situation. This type of bizarre behaviour ought to have caused some suspicion. And for the family's sake, I'm asking you to come forward. Unquote. A post mortem was carried out the next day, and the victim was identified as Jane Longhurst through dental records. Dr. Vesna Jurovic carried out the exam. A pair of women's tights had been around Jane's neck as a ligature, leading the pathologist to determine strangulation as the cause of death. The level of decomposition suggested that Jane had been dead for four to five weeks, but there were no signs of predation or maggot infestation indicating that her body had been stored somewhere cool and away from flies. Jane's clothes, purse and phone were still unaccounted for. Police began to re-interview people after the discovery. One house they went to was that of Jane's friend, Lisa Stevens. Lisa's partner, Graham, was the last person confirmed to have spoken with Jane on the day she went missing. Inside the house, they noticed a stack of cardboard boxes stamped with the word, Fragile. Graham Coots was interviewed on April 24th and asked to account for his whereabouts on the day Jane went missing, March 14th, and the day the body was found, April 19th. Coots said that on March 14th he'd been out intending to deliver products for the company he worked part-time for, Cleanies. When asked about April 19th, he said that he'd spent the day shopping for baby things with his pregnant girlfriend. He couldn't provide proof that he'd been out making deliveries on the day Jane went missing or the day her body was found. He was acting suspiciously. Clearly nervous, he frequented the bathroom and didn't give clear answers to police questions. He was arrested on suspicion of murder. When did you last see Jane Longhurst? It was the Sunday before, and they both came over. And the last time you spoke to Jane was the phone call? The phone call on the Friday, yeah. At the station... Coote said that his relationship with Jane was nothing more than friends. She was his girlfriend's friend. He denied any involvement in her death and said that the last time he spoke to Jane, it was just an ordinary conversation where he told her Lisa wasn't home and they spoke briefly about her pregnancy. His car and belongings were seized, amongst them was a set of keys. The next day, the arrest was announced at a press conference where Liz and Sue spoke of their ordeal. The 35-year-old man is from Hove and was arrested yesterday at his home address. He's currently in custody at Brighton. 
Malcolm wrote a statement to be read at the press conference. In it he wrote, I am missing Jane every hour of every day and night that passes. It is heartbreaking when your life turns a corner and new experiences occur and the one person you want to share them with is not there. Jane will always be a very special friend to me. She was loving, warm, beautiful, a fantastic musician and teacher, a great laugh, my best mate and I would have happily spent the rest of my life with her. She would always say, Malk, do you want to get married at some point? And I'd reply, yeah, maybe, whenever. She was always open about her feelings. She enjoyed the challenge of teaching children and would have loved to have had some of her own. We were going to buy a house, travel, we had so many plans for the future. For five weeks, I was praying she would be found alive and we could meet again. The day she went missing was like any other. I would not have done anything different. We were getting on great. I'm really going to miss the great conversations and nights in the pub with friends. I'll miss walking, driving about, the pillow fights and swimming in the sea. I'll miss Jane and I, being us, laughing when you're not supposed to during music concerts, with the help of Ellie. Ever since she went missing, I've been sending her all my love and this won't stop now that her body has been found. I know all her friends are doing the same. I want her to know that we all still love her. I believe that wherever she is, she's definitely okay. When I visited Upland School, a child came up to me and said, You know, Miss Longhurst was the only teacher I could get on with. We all miss her in our different ways. I'd like to say that I feel that during the time Jane was missing, everyone involved has moved heaven and earth to try and find Jane alive. I feel that nothing else could have been done, and that this whole thing is out of all of our hands. I am very relieved that her body has been found and is now being looked after, and I feel safe in the knowledge that we can all celebrate her life and have a funeral in the near future. Obviously, I hope the killer is found soon for the sake of any potential future victims, and at this point, I do not feel any malice towards the killer. My thoughts with Jane and her family, we are all trying to stay positive. I am heartbroken at the tragic loss of a brilliant friend. I apologise for not being here today, but I hope you understand how difficult this is. At the moment, I'm trying to come to terms with the loss of someone who I love very much. No one should have to go through what myself and Jane's family are, and we can only hope and pray that the person who did this can be found. Unquote. No one can prepare you for something so terrible. Mm. To lose a loved one in such a way cannot ever be imagined, and we would not wish what we are going through on anyone. We have lost someone who was very loved and so special. Please, if you think you know something, then find in your conscience to call the police. Jane will always be a very special friend to me. The car was searched and there was a distinct smell of decomposing flesh emanating from the boot. There was no concrete evidence linking him to the crime and he wasn't about to confess, so he was released on bail. Three days later, a call was made to the police by staff at Big Yellow Self Storage. The warehouse was situated in Coombe Road, Brighton. The staff had noticed a foul smell coming from a container that they assumed was from dead pigeons. The container had been rented by a man named Paul Kelly from March 25th. The caller was worried about wasting the police time, but the smell had dissipated after Jane's body had been found, and they were concerned that it may have been linked. When the police went to the big yellow storage warehouse, they viewed the CCTV footage of the man known as Paul Kelly, and they recognised him as Graham Coots. He'd first used the ground floor unit C50 on March 25th, and between then and April 18th, he visited the unit seven times. On April 18th, he was seen on CCTV entering the warehouse at 6.45pm, bringing a trolley into the elevator to his unit. Almost 20 minutes later, he emerges with a large box on the trolley, which he wheels to his car. He then goes back inside and looks at the floor, and after getting some toilet paper from the bathroom... He wipes the floor. Police believed it was bodily fluid that had leaked from the large box. The keys obtained from Coots 
opened the unit, and inside, police found Jane's clothes, phone, and purse. They also found a blood-stained shirt, a blood-stained rope, a blood-stained cleanies box, a used condom, a green petrol can, matches, and gloves. Graham Coots was re-arrested the following day, April 29th, and charged with the murder of Jane Longhurst. When questioned, again, he had little to say, stating he, quote, didn't know, unquote, if he had strangled Jane. Tell me what was in that big white box on the pallet truck. Something I can't talk about. Help me with that. Did you strangle Jane? You don't know. His computer was seized and it contained thousands of images of violent pornography. Females being strangled and necrophilia. It had been downloaded before and after Jane's death. The blood-stained shirt was forensically tested and the DNA of the blood was a match to Jane Longhurst. The shirt was also covered in semen. This belonged to Graham Coots. CCTV footage from the Texaco garage in Kingsway Hove showed that Coots had gone in there to buy a petrol can, toilet roll and black tape on April 19th at 7.40pm. This was less than an hour before Jane's body was set alight. Coots denied all involvement until six months later when he claimed Jane died during a consensual act of erotic asphyxia. He said Jane wanted him to choke her. Coots said that after Jane had called looking for Lisa, he asked her if she would like to go for a swim with him considering they both had the day off. Jane packed her swimming togs and towels and Coots collected her. He claimed that Jane had become upset over something in the car and they decided to go to his flat instead for a cup of tea. He claimed that while comforting her, they began kissing and that eventually led them to the bedroom. He undressed Jane but kept his own shirt on, conscious of his weight. After putting on a condom, he was unable to maintain an erection and they engaged in sexual acts before he said Jane placed his hand on her neck. It was at this point that he suggested they use the tights. While he was lying back masturbating, Jane was kneeling next to him with the tights around her neck. He pulled on the tights, and as he ejaculated, he closed his eyes, and when he reopened them, Jane was lying across him, lifeless. He then said that he panicked and tried to cover it up, afraid that calling 999 or the police would cause his girlfriend to miscarry their twins. He cleaned up the flat, removed the blood from the bed and brought tarpauling. He'd first moved the body to the boot of his car, then his shed and when he was questioned by the police about Jane's disappearance in March, he panicked and moved her to the storage depot. Coots said that he had a long-term fixation with breath control play and had engaged in it with several partners. At one point he spoke to his GP about his obsession. He spoke about how the fetish went from being something he was curious about to being concerned and eventually something he was comfortable with. He didn't believe it had any connection with violence. He claimed it didn't go as far as wanting to strangle women to death. Many of his ex-partners later testified that he had always had a strangulation fetish. Over 300 people attended the Church of St Peter in Brighton on a rainy day to say their goodbyes to the much-loved teacher and musician. Her wicker casket was shattered by her mum, sister, nephew and partner Malcolm. Malcolm had written a eulogy that read, quote, I spent four brilliant years with Jane and I felt privileged to have known her and her excellent family. I am heartbroken at the untimely loss of a truly great friend, someone who I felt a real love for, someone whose company I never tired of, someone who was simply great fun to be with. I am sure Jane misses you as much as you miss her. It is simply a great tragedy that Jane never had her own children. It was something she spoke of often, and I know she would have made a brilliant mother. I will forever miss her laughter, friendship, and love. Unquote. Tributes were also paid by the head teacher of the school Jane worked in. Paul Atkins said, quote, Jane's death was a tragedy, but I ask you not to dwell on this. I want to focus on her life and the impact she had on so many people. Look around and see just how many have come to pay their respects. You are here because you want to say your farewell to Jane and share the grief. Jane touched every one of our lives. Let us thank God for being able to say 
I had the privilege of knowing Jane in person. Rest in peace, Jane. Unquote. Andy Sherwood, the conductor of Musicians of All Saints, the orchestra Jane played with, read the eulogy. Mr. Sherwood said, quote, Jane packed in a lot into her short life and she will leave us with a lot of good memories. The memory of her joy, love of life and in-your-face commitment will continue to be an inspiration to us all lucky enough to have known her. Unquote. As the casket was carried from the church to the private service at the crematorium, the hymn All Things Bright and Beautiful was sung. Many were too overcome with grief to carry on singing. As the congregation left the church, the rain had stopped and the sun shone down. This episode is brought to you by Best Fiends. This casual but challenging puzzle game is the perfect break from life for us. Lately I've been using it when I'm standing waiting for dinner to cook or when I need a bit of a break from work. My favourite part is the fact that I can connect with my friends and family on there. I love comparing my little characters with Eileen's. This amazing mobile puzzle game is much more than your average puzzle game. It's rated 5 stars with over 100 million downloads. There's thousands of levels, super cute characters to collect, with a whole world right there in your hands. It's engaging, it's bright and colourful and the graphics and stories are great too. There are new in-game challenges and events every month so the game always feels fresh and renewed. You don't even need Wi-Fi to play. Trust us, you don't want to miss out on this game. Come and join us and millions of others who are already playing this fun puzzle game. Download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. We just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, Real Paper. It wasn't that long ago that the great toilet paper hoarding fest began. Real is a bit different than the brands that people were stockpiling. They're better. Real is a bamboo toilet paper brand that does good and feels good. For every roll you buy, you are supporting the real mission to provide access to clean toilets to those in need. Every day, 2.4 billion people are without access to clean toilets meaning lost dignity, exposure to deadly pathogens, increased risk of contaminated water, and loss of life. Supporting Real's mission to eliminate the threat of illness posed by a lack of access to toilets doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your comfort. You'll never run out of toilet paper again either. It's three-ply for extra softness, 100% natural and sustainable, helping to reduce your carbon footprint and the 27,000 trees cut down daily to make regular toilet paper. Real is made from tree-free, 100% bamboo paper. Zero plastic packaging, even the tape. Best of all, you can get it delivered to your door. All real subscription orders include free shipping. Real is tree free, bamboo toilet paper that does good and feels good. Use our coupon code CRIMELAPSE to get 25% off your first order at realpaper.com. The trial began in the second week of January 2004. Mr. Kelsey Fry QC leading the prosecution said in his opening statements, quote, We allege it was on March 14th that this defendant murdered 31 year old school teacher Jane Longhurst by strangling her to death in satisfying his bizarre and macabre sexual fantasy. The Crown alleges that having killed her and had his way with her, he did not dispose of her body but kept her somewhere known only to him for 11 days before moving her to a storage unit hired in a false name. He kept the body for almost a month, visiting it every three or four days until the smell became pungent and began to attract attention. The defendant then removed the body, took it to a secluded spot in the woods on Wigginhall Common, poured petrol upon it and set the remains on fire, unquote. The attorney went on to describe the pair of women's tights found around Jane's neck, quote, Although the knot was tied simply, it seems that it was nevertheless effective giving that over a month after Jane Longhurst went missing, the ligature was still sufficiently tight to be causing indentation marks on the neck. The Crown suggests that the murder of Jane Longhurst was a manifestation of the defendant's fixation with helpless and strangled women. He acted out for real on the unfortunate Jane Longhurst, the fantasies on his computer, the strangling, killing and raping of her. He subsequently kept and visited his trophy until the smell forced him to dispose of the body. Unquote. It was the prosecution's case that Graham Coots had deliberately murdered Jane to satisfy his own sexual desires. 
They believed that the murder was the culmination of years of escalating fantasies involving strangling his sexual partners. The defence held the view that Jane's death was a freak accident that occurred during consensual asphyxial sex with Graham Coots. Both sides agreed that Jane died in Coots' flat on March 14, 2003, and that he kept her body hidden until he set it alight on April 19, 2003. At the trial, Coots alleged that he didn't tell the police the truth in his initial interviews with them in the first few weeks of Jane's disappearance because he was afraid of putting his girlfriend's pregnancy at risk. CCTV footage had shown that Coots made multiple visits to the big yellow storage facility during the time he had Jane's body stored there. When police were contacted by members of staff, they were able to access the unit using a key that they had seized from Coots. Inside the unit, they found a condom containing his semen. Jane's DNA was on the outside. They also found a bloodstained shirt belonging to Coots. It was Jane's blood. Coots' semen was also found on the shirt. Other items included a petrol can, two pairs of women's underwear with Jane's DNA on one and Graham Coots' girlfriend's DNA on the other, toilet roll and black bags. The last items had been purchased by Graham Coots in a garage on April 19th, the day he burnt Jane's body. He had upgraded his membership at the storage facility to allow him after hours access just the day before. The manager of the storage facility said that he had sold Graham Coots a large cardboard box on April 9th and by April 15th a strong odour began emanating from the unit that dissipated after that weekend. Dr Richard Shepherd testified for the defence about the autopsy he performed on May 20th, 2003. He agreed that the cause of death was caused by compression due to the ligature around her neck, but did not agree about the exact way the asphyxiation occurred. Dr Jervik had performed the original autopsy shortly after Jane's body was recovered. She explained that there were three types of death caused by strangulation. The first type referred to was vascular strangulation. This is caused by an obstruction of the arteries in the neck. The supply of oxygenated blood to the brain and return of blood to the heart is cut off, resulting in the person falling unconscious within seconds. Death can result in two to three minutes. The second type was respiratory strangulation. This is the obstruction of the airways by compression of the windpipe. This prevents air entering the lungs and oxygenating the blood. Although the outcome is death within the same time frame, this type of strangulation would allow the victim to struggle. The third type of strangulation Dr. Jervik referred to was vagal inhibition. This is caused by the compression of nerve endings in the neck, which can send signals to slow the victim's heart rate. This type of strangulation leads to a quick death and minimal signs of asphyxiation or strangulation marks. Dr. Jurovic had dissected the victim's body during the autopsy and found no damage to the voice box or spine. She said that the bleeding from the mouth and nose was to be expected and would explain the staining on Coots' shirt. She also concluded that Jane's death was likely vascular or respiratory strangulation due to the level of blood found on Coots' shirt. Vagal strangulation is very unlikely to cause this. Dr. Shepherd for the defence concluded that Jane's death was caused by vagal inhibition, caused when the ligature was tightened on vagal receptors in the neck. This would have caused heart arrhythmia and it would eventually slow to a, it would eventually slow to a stop. A model of the ligature used to strangle Jane was presented as evidence by a forensic expert. He explained that a pair of tights had been tied in a half knot, enabling Coots to tighten the ligature by pulling with more force. He thought that the ligature could have been loosened when Coots stopped gripping the tights. The knot had been tied when Jane was facing Coots, but there was no indication that it was consensual. The prosecution called computer experts to give evidence of the items found on Coots' computers. Records indicated that he had visited a number of pornographic websites at times that were close to the crime. He had used the terms rape, murder and necro while searching for videos and images. The experts testified that many of the women in the imagery seemed more like victims than willing participants. The day before Jane Longhurst was killed, Graham Coots was on a website entitled, quote, Death by Asphyxia, unquote, for close to two hours. His internet usage dipped between the 14th and 24th of March. On the 17th of April, Coots had set off an alarm at the storage unit he used to keep Jane's body in and was unable to gain access. On that day, he accessed websites like Necrobabe. Necro derives from the term necrophilia, which is defined by an obsession with an erotic interest in corpses. Anil Agrawal further defines it as paraphilia, which is a deviant sexual preference, whereby the perpetrator gets sexual pleasure in having sex with the dead. 
Graham Coots claimed he could not recollect visiting sites like that and, quote, there's nothing sexual about a dead body, nothing, and the smell was getting worse and worse and worse. There's nothing remotely sexual about that, unquote. Coots claimed that it was consensual sex that resulted in Jane's death and that he simply panicked when she suddenly collapsed. He'd initially planned on disposing of the body the following day but couldn't bring himself to do so. He hid Jane's body in his shed while the police visited his home on March 21st. This is where Jane was. He then transferred Jane's body to the storage unit on March 25th until April 18th. After removing her body, he kept it in the boot of his car until he dumped it and set it alight at Wigan Hall Common on April 19th. The jury consisted of five women and seven men. They deliberated for over nine hours before returning a unanimous guilty verdict. The judge, Richard Brown, sentenced Coots to 30 years in prison. In his sentencing remarks, he said, quote, In seeking perverted sexual gratification by way of your sordid and evil fantasies, you have taken her life and devastated the lives of those she loved and of those who loved her. Everything that this court has heard about Jane Longhurst shows her to have been the sort of person whose life enriched all those who came into contact with her. Her undoubted love of her partner, her music and her life, screamed out of every page of the evidence I have heard in this case. By persisting in your denials, you have put those loved ones through the ordeal of this courtroom and have forced them to relive the last moments of her life and the unbelievable degradation of her body. You have shown not one jot of remorse." Unquote. Graham Coots has since appealed his sentence and conviction. He won an appeal for a retrial 26th of January 2005. One ground of appeal was failure to provide credit to Coots. He had been remanded in custody for 10 months and those 10 months worth of credit were not deducted from his minimum term at sentencing. Edward Fitzgerald QC argued that there was sufficient evidence of a lack of intent for alternatives to murder to have been offered to jurors at his trial. On the 19th of July 2006, Coots' appeal was quashed by the Court of Appeal. His new trial started on the 12th of June, the following year in 2007. There, Coots was once again found guilty of murder. He did, however, at this point have his minimum sentence dropped from 30 years to 26. Mr Fitzgerald QC for Coots submitted that if in a trial for murder there is credible evidence which would if accepted, support a verdict not of murder but of manslaughter, the trial judge ought, in the ordinary way, to leave manslaughter to the jury for their consideration, unless it would be for any reason unfair to do so. In the original trial, the jury were clearly directed by the judge. Quote, if you think that this was or might have been an accident during consensual asphyxial activity, not guilty. If you are satisfied so, that you are sure that this was no accident, that Jane Longhurst died because the defendant intended to kill her, or at least cause her really serious bodily harm, your verdict will be guilty of murder. Unquote. Both counsel for the prosecution and the defence thought that it would not be in the interest of the fair trial of the defendant if the offence of manslaughter was left to the jury. The Crown had already taken its stand that this was a deliberate and sadistic killing, Evidence was adduced at the original trial which would have enabled a rational jury, if they accepted it, to convict him of manslaughter. But the trial judge, with the support of the prosecution and the consent of the defence, did not leave an alternative count of manslaughter to the jury. Following deliberation, if the jury had thought Jane's death was accidental, Coote would have been acquitted at the original trial. On the 4th of July, at the retrial, the jury took 13 hours for deliberation, at which point they found Coots guilty by majority verdict. They had once again rejected his claims that Jane's death was accidental. After Graham Coots was originally convicted, Liz Longhurst began campaigning to ban violent online pornography. So that people like Jane's killer will no longer be able to feed their sick imaginations and cause such harm to others. I think, I think Jane would, be, would still have been here if it wasn't for the internet. I think it's fair it, to say that. Yes. Yeah. She was backed by many MPs, including former MP Martin Salter. He began, quote, The Jane Longhurst campaign against violent internet pornography 
We, the undersigned, object to the presence of extreme internet sites promoting violence against women in the name of sexual gratification. We note the recent horrific murder of Brighton school teacher Jane Longhurst was by a man who had become an avid user of corrupting internet sites such as Necro Babes, Death by Asphyxia and Hanging Bitches. We support the call by the family of Jane Longhurst for the government and internet service providers to take action to block access to these sites, for an overhaul of the Obscene Publications Act to make it a criminal offence to possess such images, for better international cooperation to close down sites hosted abroad, and for internet images in the UK to be included in the remit of Ofcom. Unquote. Over 50,000 signatures were collected when the petition was handed over to the MPs on the 23rd of November 2005. The aim was for the new offence to be punishable by up to three years in prison. After this campaign was fought by Mrs Longhurst and MP Martin Salter, a new law banning ownership of extreme porn was introduced into the Criminal Justice Bill on the 26th of January 2009. The law defines extreme pornography as an act which threatens or appears to threaten a person's life, an act which results in or appears to result in serious injury to a person's anus, breasts or genitals, an act which involves or appears to involve sexual interference with a human corpse, a person performing or appearing to perform an act of intercourse or oral sex with an animal. Jane's mother said, quote, I'm really very delighted it is due to be passed, but I don't think it's a magic bullet. The law is the start of good things, but I think it will be difficult to enforce. But I want the legislation on the books, even though it might be difficult to enforce. If someone else is murdered, and it can be shown the murder is due to extreme violent internet pornography, I think the police will take a strong interest. I think Jane would be proud. Martin and I have done it between us. Martin has had most of the right contacts, but he couldn't have done it without me, and I couldn't have done it without him. I think the law probably is censorship, but you have to think of the greater good. Far be it for me to deprive people of what they see as harmless fun, but any site which can encourage a person to commit murder or GBH is bad. Unquote. It's been a horrendous year for my family, with the murder of my sister the violent murder of my sister, Jane Longhurst, my, the strangulation and uh, rape. Graham Coots, who has now got life imprisonment um, for this murder, was fuelled by the internet, downloading images from websites that you pay by using your credit card. Graham Coots is a blog where he campaigns for justice in what he believes to be a wrongful conviction. He updates his readers on the cheap coffee and small chips portions he receives behind bars. He has tried to sue the prison system numerous times for compensation for nerve damage he sustained while handcuffed and 11 other claims ranging from small portions of baked beans to having to wear a prison uniform to hospital. These minor problems are a privilege that Jane will never be afforded. When Graham Coots killed her and kept her hidden from five weeks, he destroyed the lives of those who loved her, robbing her of the opportunity to have a family, as well as leaving behind his own children. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've liked what you heard, please leave us a review or some feedback. You can support us by listening to the show, leaving reviews or join us on Patreon. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks' time. Hey everyone, this is Prash, host of Prash's Murder Map. Pack your passport and jump on a plane because I'd like to take you on a journey to investigate some of the most heinous, macabre and enigmatic murders across the globe and throughout history. We'll look at forensics, psychology and more as we dissect solved and unsolved cases like Australia's Frankston Killer and a murderous family on the American frontier. If you'd like to give my podcast a try, 
You can find me on all major podcast platforms and YouTube. Hope to see you soon.